Now let me welcome everybody. Welcome to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see so many of you here today. Uh, we have a fantastic guest on a topic that I know is of a great deal of interest. And I'm really looking forward to a conversation. Now, our topic today is teaching with AI. And for the past year, we've been very focused on this. We've had a whole series of sessions. Today's session takes an unusual approach, and it's one that I haven't actually seen much of in the world, and which is one of the reasons I wanted to host this. The question is, not just how you can teach with AI, but how you can do so creatively. So not in a, in a regurgitative way, not in a rote way, but how can we use artificial intelligence tools to expand and enhance our students' creativity? Now, in order to have this creative conversation happen, I am absolutely delighted to welcome an old friend, Harry Brown. Harry is a professor uh, at DePaul University uh, in Indiana. Uh, Harry is uh, a wonderful scholar, a wonderful thinker, a researcher, a terrific teacher. Uh, I've been a longtime fan of one of his books, which is one of his one of the first scholarly books on gaming. It's actually about gaming and liberal education. And I strongly recommend that. Um, but he's done some recent work on using ChatGPT and also an image creating program, DALI, uh, to unleash a student's creativity. And uh, let me just bring him up on stage. Uh, keep in mind, by the way, he has just returned from Ireland. So at any, at any moment, not only may he start quaffing Guinness, but he may just pass out on the stage. So we got to keep him going. Um, let's see, without any further ado, let me welcome Professor Harry Brown. Hello, sir. Hi, Brian. Thanks. Oh, so good to see you. So good to see you. Where are you today? Are you at home? No, I'm in my office here at DePaul. I just, uh, just got in last night, so uh, timing was good. And um, I, I'll try to break the habit of drinking Guinness for the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it'll just be an act of cultural understanding. Sure. <laughs> so I, I have so many questions for you, but, but to begin, on the forum, we ask people to introduce themselves by talking about what they hope to be accomplishing in the next year. Now, I'm curious, what's on what's on deck for you for the summer and fall and into the spring of 2024? What projects, what ideas are top of mind for you? Well, I'll, I'll keep it. I'll keep it at teaching for the moment since that's the topic of the forum. But I'm scheduled to teach a first year seminar here uh, this uh, you know, starting August this semester. And uh, it's a it's a seminar that I've taught before called Introduction to Ludology. And this is uh, you yeah, know introduction to the study of games uh. and play. And uh, it's, uh, I've taught it before. It's, uh, it grew in part from my, my previous interest in games. Uh, there's a literary focus. We talk a lot about the, the, the relationship between games and stories, uh, but it's the first time in a few years that I've taught it. And of course, the first time I've taught it since the, uh, the advent of, uh, of ChatGPT. And uh, oh. this time when I'm, I'm adding a whole new module, and this is, this forum actually, uh, I mean, Brian and I actually started talking about doing this form uh, from a, uh, an email thread on uh, the use of chat GPT in uh, role playing games and simulations. And so I want to use uh, AI uh, potentially in having students work with uh, game design and game play, specifically in, in role playing simulations. So I'm working on that this summer. Uh, and then uh, I also want to develop a course on uh, uh, post-truth humor or post-truth comedy, and uh, there's there's of course an AI dimension in there, and uh, you know using and I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, AI and absurdism today, but I'd also like to think have students think about the uh, the comic potential for AI. It's uh, uh, lots of people <laughs> unintentionally or intentionally, and if anybody's uh, seen the, uh, the the recent uh, appearance of uh, AI generated TV commercials like uh, pepperoni, hug spot, or synthetic summer. Uh, you'll kind of see what I mean, but uh, I kind of want to see the uh, uh, opening of new frontiers in comedy with AI too. So those are two ideas, uh, AI and gaming, uh, game development and, and role play and AI in, uh, uh, in wow. comedy. Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Great topics. Great topics. Um, uh, friends, if you're new to the forum, what I'm about to do is, is absolutely shameless. I'm going to seize the mic and ask our guest a couple of questions. Uh, this is to get the ball rolling. And so what I'd like you to do, as, as, as Harry and I speak, is to think about, first of all, what interest you have in teaching creatively with AI that you brought to this, but also think about what questions you might have in response to the projects he describes. 
And by the way, before we go further, on the bottom left of the screen, there should be a link uh, to uh, a couple of applications. One of them is to DALI2, which is the OpenAI image generating program that uh, Professor Brown used, and also, of course, a link to ChatGPT. Um, so you may be inspired as we talk to try these out. Um, so just, just to begin, um, yeah, you talked about so many ways of using this, but one of them was in a class, I believe, on horror and surrealism. Is that right? Right. right. So what did what did you do? What was your experiment here? Well, I, I can I can show you. I've uh, so I've created some slides, and I know the purpose of this forum is, is dialogue. Uh, but I did just want to show everyone, please, uh, the the prompts um, the, uh, for the um, the assignments I used to um, um, use AI, and and also the outcomes. Just a few outcomes. So I'll just. I'll show you the results of the experiment um, when when we go to the slides. But there were two there were two main things I did with it in that class, um, and it was global horror and surrealism. I had a unit on uh, Japanese folklore and J horror, and uh, so we talked about the continuity between traditional Japanese uh, painting uh, yokai stories, uh, contemporary literature, and uh, and J horror. And so one thing that I did is. Uh, we started with uh, Japanese folk stories uh, alongside some uh, contemporary Japanese literature, and I had the students kind of like take passages from the uh, the stories and do visual interpretations using Dali too. Uh, and I'll show you some of the results of that too. So think about to think about the way that uh, a particular uh, archetype in uh, in Japanese folklore works its way through different styles, uh, from painting to um, to uh, to J. Har and to think about how an idea can be interpreted in uh, in two or three different visual styles. And this was key to a couple mm -hmm. of films and readings we were doing. And the other thing uh, that I did, this was uh, this was an assignment later in the uh, in the semester at the end of the semester was uh, I was kind of bothered by two assumptions that a lot of my colleagues had when chat GPT dropped uh, and which was was mostly reactionary that that students are just this is going to this is going to destroy the way that we uh, assign uh, papers and read papers in the humanities. And I think one of the problematic assumptions is that students are natural born cheaters and that the only the only possible thing that they can do with this is uh, take a shortcut to writing papers and they're not really interested in in learning yeah. anything. And obviously, that's I think that's an ethical problem uh, with with the way that we see students. The second one is pedagogical, and uh, it, the assumption is that uh, the the best or only possible response to Chat GPT is to somehow AI proof our assignments so that uh, uh -huh. particular kinds of prompts that can't be done can't be completed using uh, using Chat GPT, which automatically assumes that uh, that AI tools uh, don't really have a place in the writing or, or research process except to uh, short circuit it, or shortcut it, uh, or, or circumvent it. So. Uh, I wanted to create uh, an assignment uh, that used basically that incorporated I, AI as a, a research method in literature. So I called it dialogue with the machine and we did it at the end of the semester so that the students uh, already had uh, a portfolio of, of writing assignments that they could cross reference using uh, um, take ideas from their writing portfolio and, and dialogue with ChatGPT about them, but also have a working knowledge of uh, different traditions and horror and surrealism with which they could that they could bring into their dialogue with uh, chat GPT. So the purpose was to uh, take something, take things that they had already learned from over the course of the semester, uh, dialogue with chat GPT about it. So an informed dialogue uh, and then see what they could take from that dialogue that they didn't know based on the course <laughs> and, and what we did know. And then to propose uh, possible research paths based on that dialogue. Um, so this is, this is of course more constructive. So using using ChatGPT to give them uh, ideas for future research rather than just using it as a paper writing substitute. Nice, very, very constructivist. Yeah. So do you want to put up one of these uh, prompts or? Sure. Yeah. And there's uh, Brian. I did uh, right before about 15 minutes before I, I sent you the link. So uh, this is uh, there's. Uh, there's a few slides here, and I'm gonna I'm not gonna spend more than a couple seconds on uh, on on each one. So I, I Brian will will post the link, and mainly I want you to use these as reference points for the for the questions and the forum itself. But I felt like I had to show you the prompts and the outcomes so that we could have a 
a kind of firm basis for the uh, for the dialogue. So yes. Uh, so you got the uh, you have the link, Ryan, right? I have the link, but it wants me to, it wants you to approve me using the link. Okay. Um, um, oh, hang on, hang on. Uh, I think this now works. Uh, let me just put this quickly in the chat. Yeah. Okay. The Google Doc link, and also, um, uh, but friends, you should be able to see this now on the on the and the and the uh, chat box. Um, okay. And already okay. the, the the chat is flowing with conversations and questions about this. But um, okay, good. So the I'll go, of, I'll go very quickly. I just want to show you what I did so that we can great. we can talk about it concretely. So all right, I'll share this, uh, and I'll. Um, There we go. Oh, wait. You might want to do the slide share. Right, I'm going to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay, there. Okay, you got it? Uh, yes, experiment one. Experiment one. Okay, so this was an intro to lit class uh, this semester. The, the topic, this is uh, over here is the, uh, uh, is a slide that I shared with the class. And this is just Jabberwocky and the, uh, uh, the lesson, the basic lesson was the relationship between uh, form and meaning in poetry and uh, the way that form itself uh, can create or layer meaning on content. So this is, uh, this is uh, of course, uh, um, a nonsense poem that gains its sense because uh, Carol uh, writes it in traditional ballad form. So we're talking about ballad this, this day. Oh. And uh, uh, so how can form layer meaning on anomic content, content that is uh, devoid or confusing in its meaning? So the chat GPT prompt, and we goofed around with this in class, was uh, to write a ballad, ballad form. Uh, and this was February. This was early February. So it was the day that the that everybody was talking about the, the Chinese spy balloons. And uh, simultaneously with uh, oh, right. Taylor Swift breaking the Internet. So this is this was just. How do, you, how do you take anything, any content, uh, impose a form on it, uh, and, and how does the, the meaning of that content change uh, through the imposition of form? So um, ballad style, Taylor Swift, uh, Chinese spy balloon. So really, we just use ChatGPT to marry the news story of the spy balloon with uh, Taylor Swift songwriting technique. And uh, this is this is what it gave. And again, yeah, I'm, I won't read all this. You can you can browse it. Uh, the the pink highlights are things that we talked about in class that were uh, you know, lines that that had a certain tailorness to them. Uh, and so we we kind of like talked about the AI's ability to read and uh, Taylor Swift, like what was Taylor Swift. So form and meaning. Nice. This was a. A different form, uh, Anglo-Saxon alliterative verse. We we'd done Beowulf and Anglo-Saxon riddles prior to this, so this oh, okay. is, uh, yeah. And this is uh, the highlights here are the uh, the alliteration, and uh, it even incorporated the caesuras, the uh, the line wow. in the middle of these. So you see the so the two main things we talked about with uh, alliterative verse was the alliteration and uh, and the caesuras and the balance between the the kind of like two halves of the of the alliterative line. And so this is what it did. Um, and again, pretty good job. But again, the, the, the point was that uh, form and meaning are both interdependent and independent of each other, that you could apply mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. forms to, uh, to different kinds of content. So experiment two, this was later well, in the- hang on, hang on, one question, just a, just a quick practical question before you get on that. Did you do this as one instance of ChatGPT on a projection for the entire class or did each student get to uh, uh, Try this out. This was my demo, but students students also tried it out themselves. So we had, okay. uh, in fact, it was a student who suggested that we, like I said, just what 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 do we want it to do? And it was a student who suggested the spy balloon thing because they were talking about nice. class. So it was yeah, and uh, same class. This was on dramatic structure, uh, and we were doing Hamlet with Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead. So mm. certain some exquisite corpse. This is the basis, which is the class slide, basic dramatic structure of Hamlet. Uh, how does uh, uh, Tom Stoppard play with this structure, especially considering that one of the predominant refrains and themes in the play is not knowing. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern do not know uh, the structure of the drama uh, right. participating in. So we talked about exquisite corpse uh, and uh, what would it look like if you applied exquisite corpse to um, Tr traditional dramatic structure. So we asked ChatGP to generate 18 inciting incidents for 
potential short stories or short plays uh, involved oh. tragedy or suspense. And then what we did was, uh, so this was, it, it gave us this, and 18 of these, because there were 18 students in the class. And what they had to do is pass these sheets around in class physically and them. Um, you know how exquisite corpse works, uh, so that they could only see the uh, uh, the the stage of the drama that occurred immediately before, but n but not before that. So uh, exquisite corpse with uh, dramatic structure, and this was one of the results. And you can see, I wanted to take the picture of it and show you how they were folding it and passing it. But, uh, this is, it's, it's, it doesn't make sense because it's not supposed to make sense. Uh, you're supposed to write a narrative not knowing what, where internally the different parts of the narrative don't know what the other parts are doing because this is what Stopper does in the play. Uh, and you can see how uh, this all starts from a cat sneaking into a bedroom uh, and it ends with uh, waking up uh, from a coma 13 years later with no memory. <laughs> It takes a really interesting series of turns just because the students, just like Rosencrantz and Guildenstern, don't know what's happening uh, it, at, except what they're seeing right in front of them. They don't know the structure. They don't, they don't know the plot. And so what you get is a, a plot uh, that is an exquisite corpse uh, that, that kind of goes nowhere and somewhere at the same time. This was another one. Uh, and this one was interesting. You see here, the, the, this is like characteristic of what happens in Stoppard's play, because here uh, in, in one stage, uh, you have intentionally the speaker trying to shoot his father. And then because they uh, are here, up here in the complication, uh, and then in the additional complication, he's trying to save his father. So it is absurdist because he shoots his father and tries to save him at the same time, uh, which is kind of, uh, it's, there are moments in Stoppard's play in which those kind of mixed intentions happen. Uh, and of course, I love the wrap up uh, where the doctors replace his brain with uh, a CD of Shrek 2 so that he was able to live a normal life. So we just had the students love these things. Uh, and as I said, they're supposed to be nonsensical. They had a great laugh. Uh, and then the next stage could be, if it were a creative writing class, to take one of these exquisite corpses and to shape it into an absurdist drama or an absurdist story in the style of Tom Stoppard. So. This was for a, a literature and ecology class, um, speculative. This the, the, the topic was speculative ecology. And uh, again, this was the prompt. We were reading Peter Ward's Life as We Do Not Know It, which is um, uh, Ward is a, uh, uh, an astrobiologist who speculates on the potential for life uh, different places in the solar system. So we'd read that. Uh, and then we were, we were storyboarding a hypothetical series uh, an, a, um, a documentary series exploring the potential for life elsewhere uh, in uh, in the solar system. So mm -hmm. this is uh, the role play is that they're working for Netflix to develop a series and they're storyboarding some uh, concept art using Dolly to uh, so that they can pitch this, uh, which the CGI team will, will use to create background art and animations for the series. So. This is uh, this is the prompt right here. Uh, we did this uh, we did this in class one day and then kind of like discussed it, talked about it. Step five uh, on uh, on the next day, and uh, of course it was Dali too, but it's informed by our reading in Life as We Do Not Know It. And uh, these are some of the cool results. Uh, the keywords come from Ward's book, uh, Deep Ocean Vent Fauna Europa Jupiter. These are all uh, Dali generated images. You could be more specific, so. Uh, different exotic life forms that Ward talks about, like siphonophores. Uh, we added in, you know, we refined it so that we could uh, uh, just have a clear concept of what these um, uh, exobiological creatures might look like. And you, again, you could storyboard it using that. Um, and this is this is what I've already talked about: Japanese folklore, uh, J. Har. Um, this is the prompt, um, and. Uh, basically take a consistent theme and reinterpret it in different visual styles and then talk about a traditional Japanese painting, Japanese horror films. These are the three stories we were talking about. Um, and uh, this was, these were some of the results. So an abandoned village, we're working with uh, Hagiwara's The Town of Cats, uh, an abandoned village filled with feral cats in the style of traditional Japanese painting. Uh, and then you translate that same idea into a uh, uh, stop wow. these horror film. Yeah, so it's kind of, it, it, it's and we talked about like, what are the J horror aspects of this, of these images? And how do we, how do we see those image? How do we see those 
styles kind of mapping into films that we watched in class, um, like like The Ring and and this was this was my favorite actually. So it uh, sure. it was responding to the same prompt, um, nice. visual interpretation of uh, of Hagiwara's story, uh, except instead of showing uh, populated by feral cats, it showed their presence indirectly by uh, lots of dead rats scattered. <laughs> It was. I thought. I thought it was a weird leap, and the students loved it too. Where it's like they're not showing the cats, but they're showing the results of the cats indirectly. The results of the cats' presence with these scattered uh, bodies of rats. So we talked about how this was like. This would be a great, you know, a great technique to use if you were kind of like making a short film based on uh, the town of cats uh, as some kind of an. Uh, if you wanted to put a spin on it. Um, so again, different visual interpretations of uh, of literature, and I didn't, I don't have it right here, but the students had to isolate uh, a series of quotations or a quotation from the story that they were using to prompt the AI to uh, to interpret a particular moment in the story. And this is the last one. Sure. Uh, uh, this was uh, AI research method. So this was uh, again in in part a response to my own colleagues uh, who said that uh, um, that ChatGPT will um, you know, it's going to destroy the way that we work in uh, in literature and philosophy classes. And this was uh, so again, you can read this on your own on the slides. But this this was the prompt. Uh, basically, use ChatGPT to uh, bounce off of what we learned and, and tell us something. Arrive at some insights that we didn't learn based on what we did through this dialogue. Sure. So the paper consisted of uh, uh, a dial. The students had to kind of like edit their dialogue taking excerpts from uh, what ChatGPT told them. And of course, the creative part of this was that the students had to prompt them, ask good questions in order to get good results. And this was our class demo. We generated these questions together. Uh, and uh, it starts with a very general thing, uh, the, the basic topic of the class. We kind of ran through. I'll just, I'll go through these. I wanted you to, I just wanted to record on the slides how it all played out, but we kind of moved sure. from uh, definitions, specific definitions by Freud and Ligotti on the uncanny to a kind of broader definition of humanness and what humanness is mm -hmm. uh, to mm -hmm. uh, a discussion of, uh, of AI and humanness, consciousness, the nature of subjectivity is really interesting. And then of course the, uh, mm -hmm. the outcome, the, uh, the, the purpose of the assignment was to, uh, uh, again, create future directions for research. And based on those slides, you know, that I just kind of ran through there, there were three as a class, we kind of like, just from the demo, we extracted uh, maybe three topics that I could add to this course uh, or write about the, the next time I approach it. One was uh, disability in, uh, in horror and surrealism, which we didn't talk about much over the course of the semester, genetic mutation mm. and genetic diversity and uh, AI tools mm. and making. So, these are these are ideas right. that were not included in the course at all. Uh, of course, they're they're interesting, uh, and it's the dialogue that kind of like led us to say, yeah, we could take what we did here, and then maybe the next time we talk about this, uh, we can incorporate these topics. So that was that was the point to use it constructively rather than just as a as a covert tool for a, a completing tax. So that's it. I'll unshare. But uh, wow, yeah, thanks for bearing. Wow. Well, that's fantastic. Oh, uh, Harry, just people are going to have an avalanche of questions for you, but I want to ask one quick one myself, which is, um, was this something that you did entirely on your own, you know, grabbing Dolly, grabbing ChatGPT, introducing the classroom, or did you need support from either your department or from IT or anybody else? No, I did it on my own. Of course, you know, the, the great thing about OpenAI is that it's it's just there and the students could access it instantly in class. Uh, it was just, yeah. And I don't think I could have done it. Uh, you know, it's, uh, I mean, it, it, it made it easier that we could just kind of like, uh, just jump into it in class. Uh, so no, I didn't have, of course it was, it was supported in form with lots and lots of conversations between fall of last year and, and spring of this year on, uh, on, on chat GPT specifically, but, uh, no, no formal, no formal support. I just kind of, students were always talking about it too. So, uh, they were just kind of like naturally motivated and intrigued by uh, by the work. Um, oh, so. very nice! Oh, this is this is terrific. Um, I, I'm I'm so excited to see this. But let let let, let me get 
uh, get out of the way and um, and provide opportunity for people to ask questions. Friends, if, if you're new to the forum, remember again, the very bottom of the screen is that white band with a few different options. And uh, click the raised hand if you want to join us on stage. And otherwise, click the question mark to type in uh, a question. In fact, we have a couple of those right now. Uh, so let me just uh, splash one on the screen. Uh, hang on a second. And this is one from uh, our dear friend, Tom Hames, who has a habit of asking very elegant and uh, deep questions. Uh, Tom says, generative AI seems to demand a higher level of thinking on Bloom's taxonomy than many of our students and workers are trained to do. How do we need change teaching to raise their level of imagination? Huh. <laughs> well, I, I mean, one thing that was that was useful for me, I didn't start with this broad question of, how do I use AI in my teaching? Because we're all going to have to reconcile with it, you know, one way or the other. I always subordinated um, uh, what I was doing with Dali or or ChatGPT to the the content and purpose of the of the course itself and the specific day. So it was always. I mean, you can see in the uh, in the slides, I kind of like put the um, uh, you know the the learning goal of the day first, and then you know. And then, like, how, how do we use AI to serve that particular intellectual purpose other than making AI itself the, uh, the, the intellectual purpose and then kind of subordinating? So all my examples are, are disciplinary uh, to, uh, to literature. And uh, every, every course would, would, you know, would have its own purpose. So I would say thinking, thinking would begin first with uh, whatever the, the purpose of the course is, and then AI uh, serves that purpose uh, as a tool rather than uh, becomes a kind of like dominating um, uh, driver of, uh, of what you're doing. So we did talk about, uh, you know, in, in the classes with the students, the way that, um, that these tools could be an enhancement to imagination, uh, imagining a certain thing. And, and one thing was as a particular enhancement, like, okay, we can't go to, uh, we, we can't travel beneath the ice crust of Europa, uh, not yet. to, uh, to, to see what kind of, uh, organisms might be there, or we can't go back four billion years into the past and see what Mars might have looked like when there was water there. So uh, we could we could take ideas and and give them uh, kind of an imaginative structure using using uh, Dali specifically. So I think they can act as enhancements to imagination uh, as long as, uh, again, for me, at least uh, they were they were subordinate to the particular goals uh, of the course on that particular day and subordinate to the readings that we were doing that day. So we didn't do any of these things uh, that uh, that were not connected in somehow to the reading assignments for that day. Um, and so it didn't exactly change the way that I constructed a, a course, like a literature course. It was more that how do I uh, how do I teach the stuff that I would have included anyway in a new way? Mm -hmm. That's that's a very, very thoughtful answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Tom, as always, uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, friends, that's an example of a Q&A. Now I'm going to try and, uh, and bring in um, a wonderful scholar uh, from New York, uh, Clay Shirky, to ask a question of his and do this on video. So let me see if we can get everyone together on together. Yes. Uh, hello, Clay. Hey, good to see you, Brian. Good I'm to here. See Thanks you. so much for this. This is super interesting. Um, did you you talked about the students being really engaged with these kinds of experiments did you as you structured the assignments ask them for any kind of after the fact reflections on what they learned from the experience how they might use these tools in the future any of that kind of um you know after the fact cognition about the, yeah. the assignment itself yeah that was that was actually a big part of it you can see that uh um you know that if you look at like number five on the prompt on speculative ecologies it was it was a kind of like meta reflection on um, you know, what could, what did we learn from this? Uh, what are the limitations of it? And we actually spent a lot of time, a good week in, uh, at the end of this past semester in the, in the horror and surrealism class on talking about AI as a research tool and, and what, what, they, what they gained. We demoed this in class. We had, it was a, it was a writing intensive, a W class. And we, uh, we workshopped together, uh, with chat GPT in class over a series of days and kind of like talked about how to craft a good question. What does a good dialogue with an AI actually mean? Uh, how do you elicit uh, productive responses uh, 
what kinds of knowledge could you bring into it? Uh, all that stuff. So yeah, it was, I mean, I think we're just, at, I, the students had the sense and that we were not making it up as we went along, but that we have to rethink the way that we do research in a dialogic way uh, using a tool like this, other than just kind of like typing in, like, you know, research in the humanities didn't end uh, when we went from, you know, um, physical libraries to search engines. And so it's, uh, this is, I mean, I kind of stress the dialogue thing. It's not going to work. It's not going to write, it, it won't work unless you bring some good prompts and good thoughts into it and knowledge that you have to have good knowledge in order to ask good questions. And so we kind of emphasize this and uh, like, it wasn't like, they they, re, they came to realize eventually that they it wasn't for like outsourcing their responsibility for writing a paper, but they had to bring some responsibility uh, and awareness to the assignment uh, because it wasn't going to work if they if they couldn't ask a good question. So kind of get back to the ancient thing, like what is a good question? Uh, and we talked mm -hmm. about that too. Great, thank you. Oh, thank you, Clay. Thank you very much. And please stay safe in uh, in a sepia tone, New York. Um, <laughs> thank you. We have a, uh, so friends, if you're new to the forum, uh, so you just saw an example of a video question, and if you want to follow Clay, just hit the uh, raised hand button, and I'll put you on the list. Uh, and again, you saw Tom Hames' uh, Q&A box. So please, both the Q&A box and the raised hand are there for you um, uh, as we go. Uh, so please share your questions, and especially your, your practical ones and your theoretical ones, and uh, um, and how are, you can even ask, what are some other ways to show the presence of cats invisibly? Um, while you're thinking about that, uh, we have a, a question from uh, dear Carl Hakarainen coming to us from New England. Uh, and Carl asks, each spin of a chat produces a variant. How do you deal with the challenge of non-reproducibility? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question too. So when we, um, uh, we, we started with this kind of like broad concept of the uncanny, which, which ran through a lot of discussions uh, in our course. And uh, it was, uh, it kind of, non-reproducibility so it gives often similar answers but but not the same uh and uh if you have say 20 students in the class asking exactly the same question but receiving 20 different variants uh uh in response one thing that we could do is kind of like compare the responses uh synthesize and extract uh the best ideas or consistent ideas that, that came from uh variants to the response and we, we did that like you could just say, what are your thoughts on the uncanny uh, or it's, and it's used in film or something like that mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. different things. And then we could then we each student could uh, uh, kind of like share the response that they got. We could look for patterns in the responses, talk about the particular patterns that emerge, talk about the variations that emerge. Uh, one of the things we did in the workshop is that I asked the student to share like the most interesting thing that came out of their series of questions. So. The non-reproducibility for us was uh, was was just interesting because it allowed us to see both pattern and variation uh, and to uh, kind of like learn from both and emphasize both. One of the strategies that uh, I suggested in the course of a longer dialogue thread was to uh, identify the patterns and variations and drill on those things. Like keep asking about like mm. the human, mm. human, the human, what is, uh, and that's that kind of like that led us again down it the more specific we got the more interesting it got i guess ah that's a good takeaway that's a very good takeaway uh, in the chat uh, rachel barlow is um is, uh, has instigated a discussion about the prompt engineering uh which is very interesting uh and we take a look at that afterwards but uh, um, uh but one of the things she points out is is, is you know, trying to figure out ways either describing prompt engineering or doing it well and uh, greater specificity seems to be a, a wonderful takeaway. I, I just saw um, an interesting experiment where someone was using ChatGPT to produce detailed instructions for MidJourney. And the problem is that MidJourney appeared after the ChatGPT data set ended. Uh, so the prompter wrote a two-page description of MidJourney, uploaded that, so taught ChatGPT what MidJourney is, and then had the journey provide incredibly detailed um, down to coding level prompts from the journey, uh, which worked surprisingly well. Um, this all sounds a bit that would have been an insane sentence to say about a year ago, but now that just seems kind of uh, kind of prosaic. Yeah. Um, we have more questions uh, coming in. And Carl, thank you so much. Uh, That's a very, very good question. 
we have a, another follow-up on this um, from our friend in Madison, uh, who hopefully isn't uh, also in the, in the smoke plume. Uh, John Hollenbeck uh, asks, what media attributes are uniquely assignable to generative AI? In other words, now that we have JetGPT, we can do what? Uh, media attributes. Um, I used it a lot. Of, a lot of what I uh, used it for is kind of like storyboard. So maybe transmedia is is one thing that I use. Mm. It. You take this story and imagine it to imagine it visually. A couple mm -hmm. of the applied assignments I had in the uh, uh, in the living systems course uh, was to um, uh, again storyboard a documentary based on things that we learned about but but couldn't necessarily see. I haven't experimented mm -hmm. with the music AI yet or the or the video generators yet. But I mean that's that's coming if not already here. I mean I worked with uh, again text and uh, and and image. Uh, and I did find it useful. It, ChatGPT can't do image, and uh, and and Dali can't do text. So uh, it was interesting to kind of go back and forth between the two. Um, and uh, I think it would be I think it would be very useful in uh, any kind of course that involved any kind of transmedia component, um, mm. interesting ideas, concepts uh, from from one medium into another medium. And that's why it was so useful in in horror and surrealism because we were reading a lot of stories um but also discussing films uh and even discussing the way that uh that we might make films um you know based on our knowledge of, of horror and surrealism so yeah um but uh i mean you, you saw what I mean, what can we do with chat gpt now uh we can take apart students can easily deconstruct forms uh poetic forms narrative forms, dramatic forms. And it was just fun to kind of like see that. And I don't think it, like it didn't, if I say, you know, write a sonnet as if, or, or, you know, write a Taylor Swift song about the Chinese spy balloon. I don't think it, what it shows is that these forms at least, which which could, we used uh, the textbook that we used was Strand and Boland's The Making of a Poem, which uh, hmm. kind of like, kind of marched, it's a really good, really good first year intro level textbook on, poetic forms uh but it is it so what it, it showed that you could kind of like take the forms as strand and boland were describing them and just play with them in a whole lot of different ways so for us in that class uh it kind of showed the the by literature as play uh mm -hmm. it, it allowed us to create all these it allowed us to use chat gpt to create uh, all kinds of form you know variations on on these different forms which for, was important for that class because you have first year students, lots of non majors, lots of gen ed students, and uh, it was a way to uh, kind of uh, enliven uh, something, you know, a very traditional approach to poetic form in that class. So nice, nice for non majors in particular, and, and people just so new to this. Um, oh, that's excellent. Well, thank you. That's a, that's a great answer. Uh, we, we have more questions coming in, uh, Harry, and, and I want to. Cobble one together. Uh, that comes from uh, our wonderful friend and longtime uh, chatmeister, uh, Lisa Durf. Uh, and Lisa pointed out uh, that students not only have uneven experience and understanding of, of literature and surrealism, but they also have a very uneven background when it comes to ChatGPT and Dali. Um, and so I guess I, I'll put that as a question. As a teacher, how did you handle that? You know, when you might have a student who's already written six essays uh, using ChatGPT versus one who's never fired it up, how how do you handle that that unevenness? Step by step, and I you know I don't normally put my prompts in steps one, two, three, four, five, but the slides that I shared, we did this in class. So these are classroom prompts, not necessarily paper prompts. And uh, we did, I mean, we started from zero, like open chat open uh dolly to a, some of them who had more experience said well i like stable diffusion or i like night cafe. Mm. can i mm. use Night cafe i like working with that and oh. i did i just let them go you know it's uh, with a lot it didn't have to be dolly uh we did we, we kind of like this was a this was an interesting meta experiment but we kind of put the same prompt into dolly and stable diffusion and we kind of like talked yeah. which ones we liked or, or why or which one nice. was which one was truest uh, uh, to uh, to the reading that we were that we were trying to visualize? But no, I did it. Uh, I, I I assume that, and in fact, some of this when I said anybody work with uh, you know Dolly too, or 
um, you know, half of them would say, no, I don't even know what it is. So I started from zero and simple answer is just uh, good old fashioned, you know, spending time in class. So open it. Uh, here's how, here's where you put in a prompt, open an account with open AI um, and uh, play with it for, put the stuff up on screen, uh, walk through some demos, put them into groups uh, in class. Uh, maybe combining the students who have uh, some working knowledge and or not, and uh, just working through it in class. So the uh, uh, the speculative ecology assignment that was a that was a two class assignment where class yeah. one was uh, um, learn the tool, generate some images. Class two yeah. was uh, discuss what you've generated in relation to to Ward's book. So it's just uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I just take kind of a, a workshop approach. Oh, that's thank you. That's really really helpful. Uh, that's yeah. This is extremely helpful. And for those of you viewing this on YouTube, some days, months, years afterwards, I think this is this is a really really helpful uh, guide to, to using this. Thank you, Lisa, for for the prompt. Uh, we had a follow up uh, comment from JD in the chat who says there's also the issue of equity. Not all students can access ChatGPT anytime they want unless they've purchased a subscription. There's also concern when it comes to using ChatGPT in class. Uh, I'm wondering, that, that was a comment, not a not a question, but I'm wondering if, if, you, if you want to speak to that at all. Yeah, I, I, that's actually one reason that I use three instead of four, because uh, mm -hmm. they could do it without a subscription and they could do it instantaneously in class. Um, and so, yeah, I was I was kind of mindful of that. That's, uh, I didn't require them to use anything that wasn't uh, uh, available uh, for free um you know as reasonably as possible uh you know as accessible as possible so yeah that is uh that that's good that's going to be an issue ongoing because there was a student who's really really into this uh who kept saying we should be using four we should be using four so much mm. better and uh and i just i mean i just had to tell him but i don't i don't i don't want to require every student in the class to get a subscription um uh, in order to do this so i kind of like stuck to what was accessible available for free well, that's very smart. That's very smart. Uh, JD, first of all, thank you for mentioning the uh, the equity question. And, and you know, for what it's worth, Harry, I agree that uh, we are a student. Four is way better, but but your approach is, is the really uh, equitable one. Uh, we have a, a follow-up practical question uh, along these lines. Uh, this comes from our friend uh, Shelby uh, Rosengarten uh, in Florida. Uh, Shelby, it's always good to hear you. And uh, for once, we get to be north of you having more problems than you south of us. Um, <laughs> So the question is, these creative exercises are fascinating. How much did you talk about the AI and how much did you still consider discuss the course material? Did the AI take up more time than the original subject matter? No, uh, and I'm not an AI expert. Uh, and again, this is, uh, you know, I learned this myself just by playing with it. And as I said, in response to one of the previous questions, uh, the course material is already, is always primary uh for me um and there's there's lots of stuff that i don't i don't apply ai to every single thing that i teach it's just these particular five experiments uh kind of mm. made sense based mm. on uh, what i was doing uh yeah. especially in horror and surrealism where we talked about like uh you know the blurry boundaries of what we consider to be human uh and other mm. so mm. in that sense ai kind of naturally worked its way into the conversation uh we talked about yeah. the turning test and the uncanny valley all that stuff in that class uh uh intersections between technology and you know traditional problems in uh, in surrealism and um so yeah it's again i i, I haven't I haven't. I have very limited technical knowledge on AI, and I think the great thing about OpenAI is that, uh, again, it, uh, uh, it it breaks down a lot of those barriers so that non-experts uh, can do fun things uh, in a variety of disciplines uh, in a class with little preparation or technical support or funding, uh, and and you know, in service of uh, of of learning uh, new learning goals so uh, we didn't uh, I, I didn't i didn't pretend i said up front uh I, get, I don't have any i don't really know how this works this is a black box for me uh sure. and it, so we did talk about how to use it and how to use it well uh yeah. but we didn't talk about uh, it was always like what can we learn from this on this particular day in connection to this reading whether it's speculative ecology or japanese um, you know, yokai stories. It was always uh, the, the, 
the purpose, the content, the course content always came first for me. And I did. I only talked about AI insofar as the students had to know how to use it in order to get to what we wanted to learn about X on that day. Well, that's that's a really solid answer. Uh, thank you. And Shelby, that was a great question. Uh, thank you very much. One, one quick question for me on that, Harry. Did uh, did any of your students have a computer science background that they? Yeah, they to, did. To, yeah, to that, that guy who kept telling me that we should be using four. Uh, it was. It was a, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, he's also, but he was, he, he was great because we had all these conversations outside class about, uh, you know, um, not just like AI creating NPC dialogue in, uh, in video games, but, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of improvisational capacity for, uh, for chat GPT to like lead a DM, you know, kind of like D and D style, like tabletop experience. Uh, and, yes. uh, that's where you came in, Brian. That's that we, we were kind of like talking about that. And that's why I responded yep. to that thread that you shared. Um, but yeah, he was uh, the ones that know a lot about how this works uh, uh, are, are useful. Uh, but again, not everybody, not everybody needs that. And again, I got into this, that, that guy is actually going to be kind of an unofficial TA for me in that seminar, because he does know what goes on inside the black box. So he's going to help me develop some assignments on, um, on chat GPT in RPG in role playing games. Yeah. 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 Oh, that's that's well, first of all, it's a lot of acronyms to uh, to work through and I'm impressed. Um, but also that's great for him, um, especially, you know, as an undergrad student. Uh, this is a wonderful uh, liberal arts approach. Um, and I'm so happy for this person. Um, friends, we've got about eight minutes left and I want to make sure everyone gets a chance to ask their question. And we have a video question coming from uh, another good friend, uh, previous guest, great consultant, writer, thinker, Steve Ehrman, who's coming to us from Maryland. Um, let's see, Steve, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, except for the air quality. <laughs> oh man, stay out of it, stay out of it. As well as just, it looks misty outside. Yeah, same here. Um, I was stimulated by the, the previous question from Shelby uh, to wonder, um, A, in the context of, let's say, a BA in English, or in the context of general education, um, is, is, as you think forward a few years, um, are these tools important enough as aids to thinking of one sort or another? that the student sophistication at using them for that end ought to be developed, you know, over two or three courses. Um, the other future being where I, I think it is now, which is faculty member who thinks it would be good for one course, they use it for one course, but there's nothing coordinated about developing skills. Yeah. And I don't advocate one or the other. I really look to you with your experience. Uh, what would mm -hmm. you... That's, that's, that's a good question. Uh, I think as it becomes, um, as it develops, uh, and I don't know if it's going to plateau, it, whatever that means, but it's, uh, I like the idea of treating it as a competency. So at DePaul, for example, we have three competencies, writing, speaking, and listening, and uh, um, quantitative reasoning. And so every student uh, has to have at least one course in one of these competencies and they could, you know, any number of courses could complete that competency. I've always advocated for a fourth competency in uh, technical literacy or, I'm, and, I'm, but I'm not a, like a fourth competency T. And uh, I think uh, the advent of, of AI uh, almost makes it um, more more necessary to think because there is no discipline in which uh ai can't be somehow applied uh even even in a discipline that seems very distant from like uh like literary studies um i think that every discipline in its own way is going to have to think about its own future uh as w with this new thing in uh in its you know in, in the kind of ecosystem of the way that we teach and learn and, and research so yeah, I do think over the long term, uh, everybody, no matter what you do uh, in the classroom or in research, is going to have to uh, think about this. And uh, a dedicated course or a series of competency courses uh, in, uh, in in T in general uh, or, or AI specifically might be useful uh, if a particular institution, you know, are that given the, you know, 
bandwidth in its curriculum. So, but it wouldn't be, I'd be interested to see how that develops, you know, over the next like five years. Yeah. AI competency. Yeah, that's, that's kind of an interesting idea. Um, thank you, Steve. Hi, welcome. That's a great question. Uh, I appreciate, of course, the future looking uh, aspect of this. We have uh, another future oriented question from David Furlow in the chat who wants to know, did you get any pushback, uh, any resistance to this from, you know, I would infer, you know, from students, from colleagues, from people off the street? Students, no. I mean, they said, uh, the, the students, it was the opposite. They're like, we wish that more of our courses were like paying attention to this because uh, how can you not? So uh, it, even I, I had a lot of music students who were like telling me about like the way that AI was changing uh, the way that, that people compose. And uh, again, that, that, that's completely beyond me. Uh, but it was, uh, so pushback didn't come from the students. They almost, I mean, if if one of my classes were here responding to the last question, they would say, yes, we all need AI competency uh, because it's, uh, uh, we want to do, I mean, they didn't, they didn't say this straight out, but I sensed that they saw more potential in it than uh, like, we just want to use it to cheat, right? We just want to use it to write papers. I mean, they, they see it as something powerful uh, and uh, they, they kind of want to develop it. Colleagues, uh, as I said, um, Lots of them uh, just were like, how do we AI? There was lo there lots of kind of anxious email threads. Uh, is this does this paper sound like it was written by ChatGPT? What are some markers that I should look for potentially in papers yeah. that were written by ChatGPT? How do I craft an assignment that is AI proof? Lots of stuff to avoid. Uh, so nobody pushed back specifically on, on what I was doing. One reason I, I love to paw and have, you know, uh, stayed here for 20 years is uh, because they give us relatively uh, free range uh, as far as course development uh, and teaching. So it's um, I didn't have any uh, uh, any pushback from from colleagues other than, you know, the, other than the kind of like starting assumption that that some still haven't gotten past, uh, which is that this is going to like obviate our profession or obviate the art of writing. Uh, yeah. or, or uh, it's it's going to create, you know, a bunch of drones who just kind of like outsource their thinking to a, uh, to, a to an AI tool. So that may be that may be the kind of like indirect pushback. Like, uh, how do we instead of asking how do we use AI in what we do or use it to enhance in what we do? How do we AI proof what we do, which to me seems a little counterproductive? Well, it's interesting. I mean, it's only been a few months, but you're kind of seeing a divergence of uh, faculty into very, very different schools of thought. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, yeah, I mean, one of the reasons I started doing this uh, initially was just to try to like think through that assumption that students yeah. are gonna cheat and uh, we're not gonna be able to teach writing anymore because of this. So it's, yeah. Uh, yeah, is there is there another answer uh, to, uh, to, to writing assignments that have them talk about like personal experience, uh, their own personal experience, which ChatGPT couldn't fake. Um, or you know, developing a, a, a rubric for like spotting AI markers. Uh, mm -hmm. you tell students like not to have in their papers. It just, uh, yeah. I mean, it's um, yeah. Like you say, I mean, creative teaching. How do we teach creatively with this rather than trying to dodge it? Uh, Harry, the one thing that we can't do is dodge the end of the hour, which is about a minute away. Um, and uh, I want to seize the podium for, for myself for a second to ask you one final question. You know, looking ahead at the next academic year, you know, looking at spring 2024, um, I mean, we, you seem to have articulated one path for instructors to use in teaching with generative AI. Um, uh, this, this kind of constructivist uh, approach, this very creative approach, one that has an eye on equity, uh, one that's very playful. In, in the chat, uh, Roxanne uh, Rickson recommends that everybody uh, think about this more playfully. Educators should be more playful, which which I agree. Um, do you, you, what are some of the ways you might imagine this going? Um, so faculty following your footsteps in other disciplines, you know, everything from say economics to biology, astrophysics, I mean, what kind of constructive, playful uses of AI might we expect? music and video uh and that's uh it's mm -hmm. <laughs> i mean advertising mm -hmm. you can see it's there's you know the the synthetic summer and uh and uh pepperoni hug spot there's there's spoofs on ai generated video 
in order to right. point to. I mean, both of them are pretty deep in the uncanny valley. If you uh, if you look at them, yeah, it can't do fingers, it can't do like eyes or mouths or so it always looks weird like those cats. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I think again, as it gets that, so the student in my class who kind of like knew about a lot about how this worked, he's like, it's learning, it's learning. You know, the, the day by day, those faces are going to get better, and it's going to kind of it's going to learn itself out of the mm -hmm. valley. So I think. Uh, video composition uh, is going to be uh, uh, an interesting way to play with this. Uh, you won't have to uh, search yeah. some clip on YouTube uh, in order to uh, uh, make some, you know, point in class that you want to demonstrate uh, with video. Uh, maybe there'll be a version of AI where you could say, uh, in class, I'm I'm working on the connection between yokai, yokai stories and Jay Har. Can you generate a three-minute short film? Uh, uh, mm. Uh, applying uh, Akutagawa's The Hell Screen uh, th that we could talk about in class. So stuff like that. And music, of course, uh, I think that that would be cool too. Like maybe you could use some kind of a music AI program to create a soundtrack for a short film that you could mm. develop um, um, it, uh, as an adaptation of a particular story that we're, you know, that you're using in class. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think music and video are going to be a big part of uh, the, the near future. And uh Again, I do believe in uh, uh, you know finding uh, new uses for it through play, and uh, again, the, the more we Excellent. play, the more it learns from us. The more we learn from it, and uh, uh, again, I don't think I don't think it's going to annihilate humanistic uh, humanistic teaching and learning. Well, it seems like it's giving us uh, new venues for humanistic teaching and learning. Uh, Harry, you've been fantastic. It, it's just a delight to see this project, and I'm so grateful to you for sharing uh, all of your thoughts and your practice for this hour. Uh, two two questions before you go. One is, can I share that uh, Google Drive link? Uh, with yeah, you? sure. That's why I sent it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And and second, how can people keep up with you when they want to find out about your fall class? What's the best? Yeah, way I, have a, I have a, a smaller, non-existent social media footprint. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's partly by intention. I don't always trust myself on social media, uh, but uh, uh, you can keep up with me by uh, by email uh, Very uh, good. or uh, um, yeah, anything. I mean, just the, you you know where to find Excellent. me. Uh, I'm I've been at DePaul for a while, and I'll be here for the foreseeable future. So just reach out if you have any questions, observations, well, great. Or potential collaborations. I mean, I'm really open to uh, to uh, collaborate on a lot of this stuff. So. Well, that's a great call. And one of the things we do here in the forum is, is networking, uh, getting people together for these kind of projects. So um, this would be great. And nothing else, I want to bring you back to hear about your next uh, steps in this. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Yeah. I'll be well, happy. Thank you so much. And good, good luck uh, with everything here. Make sure, that, especially that your uh, internal clock readjusts to uh, uh, Indiana time. Yeah. And, uh, okay. and take care. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, everybody. Happy Thanks summer. Thanks again. Yeah. Indeed. But don't go away yet, friends. Let me just point out uh, where things are going. And uh, thank you, by the way, for that uh, torrent of ideas and, and questions. I, I hope you enjoyed this session and uh, found a lot to re of, of rewarding stuff. Uh, if you'd like, please reach out to Harry. You can tell he's very, very accessible, very kind. And if you want to talk about this uh, more, please hit us up on uh, Twitter or Mastodon. You can see our, our uh, logins there. And, and just use the hashtag FTTE if you'd like to keep uh, pursuing this topic. If you want to look back into our previous sessions on, among other things, teaching and, of course, AI and, of course, creativity, just look at our archive at tinyurl.com slash ftfarchive. Uh, we have more sessions coming up, everything um, uh, on college teaching, more on AI and campus economics. Just go to forum.futureofeducation.us to see more. Uh, thank you all for a great conversation. I really appreciate all of your ideas. Uh, listen, I hope everybody stays safe in this uh, wild summer right now. Um, and good luck with all of your summer work. We'll see you next time online. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs>